Hey, welcome to this podcast. Oh, hey. <laughs> Sorry, See, take your time. Oh, it's kind of <laughs> making me feel better. I'm not the only one who's nervous. Yep. <laughs> hey, welcome to today's interview. I am interviewing Rachel Manning, who is a current client of mine. Rachel and I have been in a coaching relationship for three years, and I'm going to tell you all about why this is such a great person to listen to in terms of growth and development. But the reason I'm talking to Rachel is that all month I've been talking about what are the big things that hold us back from having what we want. And I've talked about money mindset and I've talked about putting yourself on the list of things to take care of. And today, the reason I want you to listen to Rachel's story is because the other big thing that holds us back is when we are not willing to take a risk. And that is one of the things I am most proud of Rachel for doing over and over and over again. So Rachel, I so appreciate your time and energy here because I know this is not your favorite thing to do. So I appreciate that you're doing an interview with me. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> Rachel is the director of client relations for a large financial firm. And the way that she tells it is when I first met her, she was the director, just as she is today, director of client relations. But she says this job kind of came to her accidentally. And what we have been working on are her leadership skills and her risk taking skills. So let's get started. Rach, tell us about what you wanted to achieve regarding leadership and communication when I first met you in 2017. Well, uh, because I had that imposter syndrome, uh, in the beginning, any little thing made me nervous. Um, I didn't even actually know exactly what I wanted to achieve as far as leadership goes. I mean, I knew I needed to work on my confidence. I knew that I needed more, um, I needed to work on my ums, and I probably... <laughs> Felt that I needed to work on my posture to make it seem like I belong mm -hmm. where uh, I learned that talking to you it actually um, took a lot of deep difficult conversations to figure out really uh, what I wanted out of the coaching experience yeah let's talk about how you started with coaching though because this is a really kind of funny thing you remember you were at a yoga <laughs> event and mm -hmm. won a gift certificate to come see me and the first risk that you took was actually cashing in that gift certificate. Mm -hmm. you remember that? Yes. Yes. It just kind of came at the best time. I was looking for a coach and it worked out and it is the biggest risk to you. Who uses gift cards? Right? <laughs> right. So you kind of came to me and I remember you saying, I, you, you knew that you wanted to become a stronger leader. So you had a vision, but you, if you had done what most people do, which would be to not take the risk, not do the hard work, not make the change, you would still be in that really anxious space of feeling like this job was an accident. I shouldn't be here. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. I actually took your first advice and got a therapist. Right. So working with you and a therapist hand in hand really does go together. Yeah. Let's talk about that for a second. What do you see as the difference between coaching, what I provide you and what your therapist provides you? Uh, we talk about things from childhood. We go a little bit deeper, um, constantly talking about feelings, which is something I hate doing and I'm not good at. Um, in really describing every part of the feeling, whether it's a thought or a physical feeling. And that's you and your therapist. That's what you talk about. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then uh, how, is, how is coaching different than that? Uh, it really does go hand in hand. Um, I will talk to my therapist about things that we've talked about and she'll give her intake on it, make sure that we're all on the same page. Mm -hmm. um, and then I'll do vice versa. I talk to you about what I talk to my therapist. Right. Um, and so I might talk to you about bigger picture uh, work and professional things that I want to work on. And then uh, I meet with my therapist weekly so I can talk to her. Sorry if you heard that. Um, no, that's okay. I, okay. <laughs> I can talk to her about 
things that are going on right now. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, just this week, actually, coincidence, I uh, was starting my virtual therapy and a coworker came in to tell me about this huge obnoxious problem. And so I was able to talk it through with her. Uh, and I've realized, just like I've realized with you and throughout the years that I tend to avoid difficult situations. Mm-hmm. So we talked through how to blaze through head on and figure out who the difficult conversations I need to have, not if I'm going to have them. Yeah. You've gotten really good at that. Mm. Um, I always like to say the difference between therapy and coaching is the therapists. I always see the therapist role is like to look past and find the source of a wound and help with the healing and uncover all of the garbage that created the wound. And then my job, I'm not equipped to do that. I'm not trained to do that. So I like to meet my clients where they are and give them the tools to help them move forward. So I really believe that coaching and therapy can work hand in hand and you've mm-hmm. done a beautiful, <laughs> beautiful job with that. So Thanks. when you, when I met you in 2017, you had this job that you say accidentally fell in your lap and you felt like an imposter. Tell me what some of the struggles you were having in terms of leadership and communication at that point. Well, um, I never felt like I was good enough because I didn't feel worthy of the job. I felt very immature. Uh, I didn't really even feel like an adult, let alone an adult professional in a leadership role. Um, I just happened to be the next person in line to get the director role. And I didn't even have the experience or the education. There's required exams. So I rushed to get the required exams, but the experience had to come with time. And it took a while to realize that I actually was doing exactly what I should be doing to get that experience. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would struggle with something just as simple as going out to a new office to train a new employee because my anxieties our traveling is very difficult for me. I get anxiety. I leaving my bubble, my home, my space, uh, talking to people I don't normally talk to gives me anxiety is, you know, the small talk, the remembering what they like to do and then bringing it up in conversation. Um, it's, it's a very mental, it's a mental game uh, and it's exhausting. And so you have to, and then you're meeting somebody for the first time. Uh, so, then you have to gather yourself to train them and train them effectively and not waste anyone's time. So that's a lot uh, to carry around in your backpack. It's, you know, so struggles that may, maybe other people uh, experience, but maybe not. It just felt like everything I, I did in that role was a challenge every day. So it was very exhausting. Yes. Um, so my, my next question was going to be, why is this so important to work on? But I'm hearing why it was so important to work on. You were exhausted and doubting yourself mm-hmm. all the time. Mm-hmm. I really actually, at the time that we met, I, I didn't think I was smart mm-hmm. and, uh, it's just so strange now thinking about it because it was just a fact like I just wasn't smart enough to do anything else, anything that anybody was doing. Um, that means that I was struggling with tests that I was currently studying yes. for. I wouldn't speak up in meetings. And if I did, I would beat myself up over what I said because it wasn't articulate enough. Or, you know, if I'm saying it, they're already probably thinking about it. So like, why would I say it at all? Um, and So that's in and of itself exhausting, but also it's just so negative. And how are you going to improve or grow if you're constantly putting yourself down? So um, that's something that I learned is that I actually am smart. Mm -hmm. Um, There's other, you know, test scores from high school are not the identifier (laughs) to tell me that I'm (laughs) smart. That's a fair point. You know, um, everything I'm hearing you say right now, I want to just thank you for saying it because first of all, I think so many people out there have the same thoughts 
and anxieties and worries and self doubts. But most people walk around just like, like putting them back in on themselves, like poisoning themselves with it and thinking that they're the only one. So I want to just honor that you are saying these things out loud, that you are so courageous and brave to say these things out loud. But I want you to know how many people are going to feel relief to know, oh my God, I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. The other reason I love that you're sharing this is people who don't have anxiety struggle to understand people who do have anxiety. It doesn't make sense to them, right? So the fact that you're just laying it out there and unveiling your thoughts for those people who don't understand this, it's like, oh, this is very real for people. It's very logical to those people who have anxiety. And it's really helpful for us who don't walk around with anxiety to get inside the mind of somebody who does. So thank you for that. Yes, it is a twisted world for anxiety. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so what kind of growth have you seen in yourself, both personally and professionally? Uh, well, I did want to bring up, because this is part of growth too, um, and all of the stress and anxiety for my experience is my sleep habits. Mm -hmm. So... Um, in the beginning, I've learned what my uh, tactics were to avoid my anxieties mm -hmm. and um, I would nap. And I just feel like that's something so strange to talk about because normally if people are stressed, they don't sleep. And I was the complete opposite. And I've had to learn that, you know, why I nap, what mm -hmm. other strategies I could take so that I don't have to constantly avoid because it was, uh, it was harming me. It was taking time away from what I could do to actually be productive throughout the day. And then it was also that negative effect afterwards, putting myself down for napping. Yes. And so now I think part of growth is I still like to sleep. And so I've just accepted that and I put that as a priority in my day if that's something that I want to do. And I just, I don't use it to avoid. I use it to do what's best for me. So good. And so I feel like I've learned how to get a normal sleep routine that's normal for me. Um, and so that's one of the uh, growth opportunities there, yes. both personally and professionally, honestly, because it affects both things. Mm -hmm. But um, another, <laughs> gosh, personally, I feel like a new person because when I first started with you, I was in my 30s and I was still asking my family for permission on things. Right. I was still, um, you know, they told me what to do. My brother in laws were constantly, Rachel you can do whatever you want to do. And my sisters were like, no, she, she <laughs> needs us. She needs us. And so uh, this week was a, an interesting week for me because it all came full circle for me because my mom is a, a big thing. Um, I always have to take deep breaths before answering the call. Um, and there she was, you should be doing this, you should be doing that. And I took one large deep breath and said, you're shooting on me. You don't have to tell me what I should and should not do. Oh my God, I'm so proud of you. And then she took a deep breath and was taken aback and she said, I shouldn't? What do you mean? You don't need me to? And I, I finally realized that I'm, I know I'm capable of doing what what I want to do and actually figuring out what I want to do, but she needs to catch up to that. And I need to just have those direct conversations and just let her know that I'm fully capable and I'm stronger now and I can do these things. And she was really happy to hear that. Actually, she was really like, um, not insulted, not anything. She was just really happy to know that like I, because that was her next response was you're right. You're old enough. Wow. That is amazing. It was a big, That's a thank big you. Moment. Yes. It was a big week. Those are great examples. Um, is there anything else you want to share about something that you can do now, maybe like in the office or with your staff that you were uncomfortable doing before? Oh, sure. I mean, those direct conversations, I just keep getting better and better. 2020 is my year. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you were born for 2020, Rage. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> So uh, 
per, uh, professionally, yeah, my coworker. Um, so I have a coordinator who helps with all of the service work within the clients. And he started last year and he had another position uh, before that within the company. And so when he moved to to our position, I kind of went in expecting him to know more than he did. And then I think that he thought he knew more than he did. Uh And so it was a sort of a strange battle where um, he wasn't, it seemed like he wasn't pulling his own weight. Mm -hmm. And I got some complaints about that and I was seeing the effect of it. And so I felt like I had no choice but to have that direct conversation. Um, And I actually learned something from it. I learned that, everyone learns in a different way and everyone communicates in a different way. So I just had to connect with him in the way that he could respond and and take it all in. And so I learned that he actually uh, strives on feedback. He loves it. Um, And so, and he, he encourages it and welcomes it. So we had that open dialogue, open communication, and then thrived off of it. And it was perfect timing because then we went home. So now uh, we put- You mean for COVID? You, you, you start working from home? Oh, yes. We worked from home for two months because of COVID. And because we had those systems in place and those direct conversations, working from home was a lot smoother. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I had to learn how to manage from a remote right. location. Right. And now our program- he's thriving. I'm thriving. Our program is thriving. So, um, that was a good, good win for us. I have definitely watched you learn how to have hard conversations, which actually most people avoid because it feels hard in the moment, but what it does beyond the moment of difficulty or discomfort, then you can just release yourself from telling yourself stories about it, right? Like how much time and energy do we spend making up stories about what this person is doing and why they're doing it and what they're thinking and what their next step might be and what they think of me and blah, 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 blah. And it's exhausting, but to have the difficult mm-hmm. conversation. And then the beautiful thing is you have a hard conversation. Not everybody's going to love you for it. Not everybody's going to be like, thanks, Rach. That was awesome. But they get used to it. It's like we train mm-hmm. people to be the recipients of difficult conversations. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's so good. Do you have any piece of advice uh, for somebody who was struggling with the same kind of things you were struggling with? I would say definitely get a coach. Mm -hmm. Um, And also, you know, get a coach, know that you're not alone, uh, but also be aware and alert to your surroundings because you never know when you're going to learn something from somebody. Um, I learn from my coordinators all the time. I mean, I'm in client relations and I have a lot to improve to handle difficult clients. Um, And I learn from them all the time, every day and how to, how to do anything. You just don't know what you're going to learn and when you're going to learn it. So just be alert. So it's almost like, and your coordinators hierarchically are lower than you, right? Mm -hmm. Like on the food chain. So Mm -hmm. at the corporate food chain. So you're saying like, you can learn from people who are above you in the journey and not have not quite been where you are in the journey. Mm-hmm. There's like, mm-hmm. something to learn from everybody. I love that. That's great. There's always something to learn. There really is. I agree. <laughs> I'm a lifelong learner too. Hey, what are you most proud of? Um, let's see. Oh gosh. I, hmm. interesting. I got to think about this for a second because I, I just already like kind of like exploded all of my secrets to you. <laughs> well, what are you most proud of in terms of how you're living your life right now, both professionally and personally? Um, that I am happy. Mm. Uh, I, I can finally see that I have put in work, this whole, um, coaching therapy thing that we're doing, (laughs) it's kind of mind blowing to me, uh, because if you were to say three years ago that I would be saying and doing these things today, I would say you're, you're a different person. Like, yeah, not in this lifetime. Yes. To say you're happy. 
what a relief that is. I, you know, that is like, <laughs> anytime you ask somebody like, how would life be better if, you know, and then fill in the blank, they always go, well, I'd be happy. And it always seems like this aspirational, aspirational, unattainable thing. And you just mm -hmm. looked me straight in the face and said, what am I most proud of? That I'm happy. The other thing I want to reflect back to you, Rach, is I know that whatever's next for you in your journey, whether it's to continue on in this company and move up the, chat, the, 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 the ladder or to do something else, and I don't know what that might be, I know that you have the confidence to be able to see that for yourself, that you don't feel stuck anymore. Mm -hmm. That's a big one. That is a really big one. I, and honestly, I kind of want to go in on that a little bit because I really thought that um, I, I got this job accidentally, accidentally, and I just happened to be good at it. Like I don't really have the right skills, but I just like happened to be good at it. And I always felt like I'll never be able to be good at anything else because mm -hmm. I, I'm not smart enough and I can't do those skills. I just happen to be good at this one thing. Um, and now I'm realizing that this one thing I actually worked really hard at being good at, I deserve it. And I can, um, kind of, uh, bring those skills other at other places. I can learn other things. Yes. Yes. I'm so proud of you. Thank you for sharing all of these insights with us. Is there anything else you want to share before we wrap up today? Uh, oh, I would say, you know how they say dream big. I mean, you would just be so surprised of what you are capable of doing. It's more than you can even imagine. I agree a hundred percent. And I've watched you. <laughs> I have watched you so much over the three years we've known each other and been working together, how much you've blossomed and also how much the work that you've done coaching and therapy wise, how it's benefited the bottom line for your company. You know, you have become better and it's, it's better for them also. You, not only are you happy, but you're better for your company. So for those of you thinking that this work is too hard to do, that it doesn't really yield results, go try somebody else if you've tried somebody in the past and it hasn't worked for you, but know that when you do this work, it's not, it's not just for you. It's for all the people around you, your family, your friends, your, your clients, your coworkers, your, your bosses, right? So Rachel, again, thank you so much for your generous and honest feedback today. It's so helpful. Thank you. Bye everyone. Bye.